one, zero. We have commit, we have, we have lift off. Lift off at 751 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that was NASA's Apollo 8 mission launching on this day 50 years ago in 1968. The historic mission is best remembered for this iconic photo of Earth rising on the lunar horizon known as Earthrise. It was taken by astronaut Bill Anders on Christmas Eve 1968. Chip Reed spoke to one of the astronauts on that famous flight. In 1968, spaceflight was in its infancy and was a thing of wonder. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. Walter Cronkite anchored CBS News coverage from the Kennedy Space Center. But what a beautiful flight. Man, perhaps on the way to the moon. In some ways, does Apollo 8 feel to you like it happened yesterday? In some respects, yes. It, uh, it's never gone away from me. We met one of the astronauts, Jim Lovell, at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. Sometimes I look back and say, you know, how do we ever do that? Lovell, Frank Borman, and William Anders were the first humans to leave Earth's orbit, circumnavigating the moon 10 times. The mission was planned in just four months as the U.S. raced to beat the Russians to the moon. NASA's flight director believed they only had a 50% chance of coming home safely. Some of the odds of, of trying to be successful in that mission are overwhelming. And perhaps at that time we didn't even understand what the odds were. The mission may be best remembered for this photo, Earthrise, our planet as seen from the moon. And for a live Christmas Eve broadcast, the most watched TV program ever at the time. And God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Lovell also flew on Apollo 13, which had to abort plans to land on the moon after an explosion in an oxygen tank. But he says Apollo 8 may have been even more momentous. 1968 was a very bad year. The Vietnam War was going on. There was uh, assassinations of prominent people and uh, student uprisings. And finally, we brought back something that the Americans could be proud of. 50 years later, that pride still remains. Chip Reed, CBS News, Washington. And joining me now from Tulsa, Oklahoma, is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Jim, welcome. You know, most Americans are more familiar with Apollo 11, the first mission to land men on the moon, but Apollo 8 was instrumental in bringing that to fruition. Tell us more about the particular mission of Apollo 8. What was the objective? So you have to remember, at the time, the United States and the Soviet Union were in a space race. Uh, the space race was about technology, it was about political prestige, and, and really it was about which political system was better than the other. Um, and, and if you remember, at the time, uh, the Soviet Union had beat us to space with Sputnik, and of course they beat us to space with humans when Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth. So the United States was still behind in the space race, and what Apollo 8 was was the first opportunity for the United States of America to achieve something monumental that established us as a head in the space race. We didn't land on the moon, to be clear. What we did is we launched on December 21st uh, to orbit the moon for the first time. And so our astronauts flew within 63 kilometers of the surface of the moon, orbiting the moon for about 10 hours on Christmas Eve, uh, and they made it home safely. It was a very daring, and in fact, some would describe it as a dangerous uh, mission, but at the time uh, during the space race, it was an important objective of our country to get ahead, and that's what we did. And that mission brought back some of the most iconic images of our planet that we now have. Was this the first time that we Americans took a good look at our planet from space? That's exactly right. We had had images, we had images of Earth from space, but what we didn't have is an image of the entire Earth from space. We had certainly never seen an Earth rise above the lunar surface. Uh, and of course, as our astronauts were orbiting the moon, they were able to get those pictures, ultimately present those pictures uh, to an audience on Earth on Christmas Eve, in fact. And when they broadcast from the moon on Christmas Eve, one out of every four people on the planet either heard or saw that broadcast and really saw those images from the moon 
of the Earth coming above its surface. Uh, what, a, what an amazing achievement. And when we talk about one out of every four people on the planet seeing or hearing that, that includes tens of millions of people that were at the time behind the Iron Curtain uh, where Christmas was still illegal. And, and, and they broadcast a message about Christmas from the moon uh, on Christmas Eve, which was just an, an amazing day. Of course, I wasn't born yet, but a lot of people watching this were. Uh, and I can only imagine what a big day it was for our country. What an emotional moment it must have been to uh, collectively be a part of that. Um, so how important then was this mission to Apollo 11's future success with actually landing a man on the moon? So each of NASA's missions builds, they each build one after the other uh, and make it even safer for the next mission. And of course this was, in order to achieve a lunar landing, we had to prove that we could get into lunar orbit and specifically a low lunar orbit and then prove that we could leave lunar orbit and, and do it with, a, with, with just a single engine. Um, and we were able to do that on Apollo 8. So, uh, Jim, since I have you here, I'd love to get your perspective on the current state of our space age. A lot of people have been discussing when or whether we will be going back to the moon. Do you think that's going to happen anytime soon? Absolutely. In fact, the president's Space Policy Directive 1 says that we will go back to the moon. This time, though, we're going to do it with commercial partners, and we're going to do it with international partners. And this time, when we go to the moon, we're going to stay. Uh, the key element in Space Policy Directive 1 is to go sustainably. We know what happens when we reuse rockets. The cost of access to space goes down and access to space goes up. Well, we need an, an entire architecture between the Earth and the Moon that is reusable. Tugs that go from Earth orbit to lunar orbit. We need a reusable command module that's in orbit around the Moon permanently. We call it Gateway. It's under development right now. And we need landers that go back and forth to the surface of the Moon to be reusable as well. And that separates today's era from the Apollo era. What we're doing now is we're building a sustainable return to the moon so we can go back and forth over and over again with humans, but also with rovers and landers and robots. And we're doing it with commercial partners and international partners to make it even more sustainable for the long term. What we don't want to do is go back to the moon and leave flags and footprints to, to, to not go back again for another 50 years. So you think... Uh, this time when we go, we're going to be sustainable. So you think the private, privatization of space is necessary then? You know, companies such as SpaceX, Blue Origins, Virgin, United, you, you think that they will all have an influence on space travel and perhaps work with NASA? They already have, and they already do, absolutely 100%. In fact, what we're seeing now is that the cost of access to space is going way down. In many areas, NASA can today be one customer of many customers rather than the owner and operator of a system. Um, and of course, the providers are competing on cost and innovation. So where there is a robust commercial marketplace, NASA needs to be one customer of many customers and, and have providers that are competing on cost and innovation. That drives down our cost of access to space in areas where there is a, a robust commercial marketplace, for example, low Earth orbit. Then we can use our resources to go further and do more. When we talk about going back to the moon, right now there's not a commercial marketplace to go back to the moon. But Space Policy Directive 1 says this, it says that we're going to use the resources of the moon, which means that once we retire risk, once we prove capabilities and technologies, there will be a day when commercial enterprise is going back and forth to the surface of the moon and then NASA can hitch a ride, if you will, or we can take advantage of being a customer of that robust commercial marketplace and then we can go even further. We can go to Mars and other destinations in our solar system. Every step along the way, we're proving capability, we're retiring risk, we're commercializing, and then we're using taxpayer dollars to go to the next step. In June of this year, President Trump announced his plan to create the sixth branch of the military, the Space Force. How would NASA be incorporated into the Space Force? Would it be folded into it or would it work separately? So NASA is not a part of the Space Force. NASA does exploration and discovery. We do science and we do development. And we do these things with international partners that sometimes uh, terrestrially we might not have a good relationship with. For example, Russia. But space exploration has this kind of special um, 
connotation where we can actually collaborate and cooperate with countries that we normally don't collaborate and cooperate with. That being said, um, when you think about what the Space Force is, I used to be a member of the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, I voted for the Space Force three times. Once on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, once on the Full Armed Services Committee, and on the floor of the House of Representatives. And when we voted for it on the floor of the House, it got 344 votes in a strong bipartisan vote. That's an important point to make. It, it is not a partisan issue. What's happening in space is very dangerous. And some of our competitors have declared space to be the American Achilles heel because of how dependent our society is on space. The way we communicate, this is television. Some people are going to watch this maybe on DirecTV or Dish Network. Maybe some people are going to watch it on the internet, internet broadband from space. The way we navigate, the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we do disaster relief and national security, the way we you know, do understand weather and predict weather and understand the climate. All of these things are dependent on space. Now here's the thing that's fundamental. When you think about banking transactions, every banking transaction in this country is dependent on a timing signal from GPS. The way we regulate the flows of electricity on the power grid, dependent on a timing signal from GPS. The way we regulate the flows of data on terrestrial wireless networks, dependent on a timing signal from GPS. We as a society are far better off today our standard of living is far higher. We're feeding more of the world than ever before because of space capability. And that's a wonderful thing. But it also does something else. It lets our competitors around the world believe that if they can damage space, they can damage the United States. What the Space Force says is that we're not going to allow that to happen. I was for it as a member of the House of Representatives. As the NASA administrator, I will say, NASA does not get involved in those activities. We do science, mm -hmm. exploration, and discovery, and we do it with our commercial partners and our international partners. And so we don't, we like that separation from the military. We're sure. not going to be a part of it. But wouldn't but I you at least say, be able to share NASA the science? Has, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you, you probably have engineers that are trained, you know, I'm sure the military has engineers that are trained in the same sorts of sciences that your NASA engineers are trained. Wouldn't you be able to ch share that information? Well, sure, and, and to be clear, when you think back to the beginning of the space age, our first rockets were, in fact, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Right. Usually the technology goes from the military to NASA, not the other way around. Uh, but, but the reality is NASA will remain absolutely separate from the DoD operations in space. Right. But it's also true that we have, we have hundreds of billions of dollars worth of technology and capability in space as an agency. That technology and capability needs to be protected. Plus we have humans on the International Space Station and they need to be safe as well. Right. Anybody who believes that they're gonna damage the United States of America by damaging space, they need to know that there will, there will be no advantage to doing that uh, in the world today. Jim Bridenstine from NASA, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. Thank you so much.